My name is Paul Turek, and I'm the director of the Turek Clinic in Beverly Hills in San Francisco. Today I want to talk about concepts in optimizing sperm retrieval. So let's take a case to start. A man with no sperm count, uh, normal or abnormal hormones, high or normal or low testosterone, and he'd like a child. Maybe it's genetic, maybe it's acquired, maybe he had chemotherapy for cancer or some treatment. These men have possibilities now, and I want to talk about ways that I and others uh, optimize them for these procedures that they may need to find sperm, because testicular sperm in men who don't have ejaculated sperm can be very valuable. So this is a very difficult field in, with, in how you find sperm in men with non-obstructive azospermia. So it's sterility in the ejaculate due to the lack of obstruction. These are men whose testicles aren't working as well from whatever cause. And these can be very difficult problems and I equate it to high school kids answering geometry exams or calculus exams and the one on the left in your slide is a man who, uh, a kid who just couldn't answer it and ended up giving up. The one on the right to, or to answer his problem with momentum and force uh, and angular momentum, he actually put an elephant in the way and blocked it and said, I can't answer the question. There's an elephant in the way. And he got zero points for that. So these cases can be as frustrating as that. So I want to talk about ways to optimize sperm retrieval in men with non-obstructive azospermia. And I break it into three ways. You want to optimize the patient. You want to optimize the procedure itself that's used to retrieve sperm from the testicles. And you want to optimize the laboratory. So let's start with the patient. How can you optimize the patient? Well, a lot of work has been put into by myself and other researchers on getting men ready for this. So it's not just a simply a matter of scheduling surgery and doing it at the time of assisted reproduction like IVF and ICSI. There are ways to do this. There's Clomid. You can give Clomid medical therapy to men and Dr. Niederberger's study showed in 42 men that some subclasses of men with this problem will develop ejaculated sperm. You can actually give drugs called HCG three to four months in advance. And here's a study from Japan that showed that although these men failed their first microdissection testicular sperm extraction, when they were given HCG-based therapy for several months and, done and went forward with another microdissection in the same institution, they got sperm 27% of the time. When men weren't given the medication and went for a second procedure, they, never, they didn't get sperm again. That can take advantage of the situation when it's difficult. We actually used HCG once in walruses and they conceived naturally. So I love HCG. Other medical therapy, Dr. Schlegel and the group at Cornell have popularized aromatase inhibitors. These are breast cancer agents that are used for male infertility off-label. And most of this stuff is off-label use, but it works quite well. And even men with low sperm counts, they can get men with higher sperm counts and men with typically started with Klinefelter syndrome, genetically infertile, they can get, have higher chances of sperm retrieval and may even develop in some cases of non-obstructive azospermia, they can develop ejaculated sperm. So that can prevent a sperm retrieval. Varicocele repair is not a medical therapy, it's a surgical therapy, but it can in fact help. 39% of men in a meta-analysis of all the studies looking at varicocele repair in men with non-obstructive azospermia 39% of men develop small numbers of usable modal ejaculated sperm after surgery. You have to wait six to eight months, which can be an issue, but it can often be helpful in the right patient. Not everybody, but the right patient. So that's medical therapy for the man before anything's done. What about men who have small numbers of sperm in their ejaculate, called cryptospermia? Well, it always makes sense to look in their ejaculate hard before you're doing a sperm retrieval, well in advance even. Uh, because about 20% of the time in men with non-obstructive azospermia, if you look hard enough in the ejaculate with centrifuge pellet spinning to demand some expertise, you will find sperm and that sperm could be used. So here's an approach that we use at the Turek Clinic. So in Beverly Hills in San Francisco where I'm based, we look very hard for this small numbers of ejaculated sperm. And if it's reliable, we have them bank it. So on the right hand side of this algorithm, reliable ejaculated sperm, yes, you start banking the sperm and then go forward with IVF and ICSI with a combination of bank sperm 
and ejaculated sperm. If they don't have a lot of time and they don't have a ja reliable ejaculated sperm, in the, in the left-hand side of the figure, I go to microdissection. Yes, that's true. Dr. Turek, the father of mapping, actually does microdissections. But I'm going to give you a balanced view of it. So microdissection is very good when you don't have a lot of time for maternal age reasons or whatever. If you have a little bit of time, I like to do fine needle aspiration mapping to figure out where the sperm are in these testicles before you go forward. And if you have a little more time, then I really like to do treatment with medical or surgical therapy to improve sperm production before going forward, and that way increase the odds of not having a sperm retrieval procedure, which actually men do not prefer. They prefer not to have a sperm retrieval procedure if given the option. So what happened in a series of men that we found had cryptozospermia? There were 40 men over two years, and this was at the Turek Clinic, and we said, listen, let's see if we can freeze this sperm and use it. So when men had reliable ejaculated sperm, we found that 85% of them were able to bank sperm ahead of a procedure. And 40% of the time, there was sample to sample variability. So it wasn't easy to do. They needed several samples. And then when they went forward, then they banked modal and non-modal sperm. 60% banked modal sperm. Some did not have any sperm reliably, and they couldn't. And some just had non-modal sperm. That's the 15%, but 85% could do it. And then when you went forward with these couples, you find that most guys with reliable low numbers of ejaculated sperm used it for IVF successfully. And a small percentage needed to thaw some, and a, a small percentage needed to have a procedure because they became unreliable and the ejaculated and bank sperm didn't work. But when you use that sperm from the ejaculate, the fertilization rates with IVF and ICSI are the same as any other situation. They're very good, 60%. And the pregnancy rates ongoing or births, 46% in a small number of patients. So ask me, I like this sperm. I work hard for this sperm. Men like it because they don't need procedures. And why would it be different than any other sperm? Why would it be better to go to the testicle when there's low numbers of ejaculated sperm? It doesn't make sense to me. And I use the bucket analogy. If a bucket is three quarters full of water, that's the testicle that's non-obstructed with sperm in it. It's not enough to get out. But it's the same system with a little more sperm in it when you have cryptozospermia. The bucket's not quite full, but it can splash out into the ejaculate. And you're dealing with the same genetic problems with the sperm. The same. There's really no difference. And that's what we're kind of seeing is that this stuff is good. So optimizing men for sperm retrieval may mean avoiding sperm retrieval. How about the procedure itself? Well, there's lots of places to get sperm. So I'm going to give you evidence-based summaries of each source of sperm, the vas deferens, the epididymis, the testicle. So this is for obstructed men, which I haven't talked about yet, as well as non-obstructed men and the ejaculate. Here's a guiding principle. Make sure your surgeon follows this principle. Since Assisted reproduction is not perfect. It's not 100%. We really need to develop ways to get sperm out that involve one procedure, not two, not three, and ways to save sperm so men don't need procedures, repeat procedures. And we should do procedures that are less morbid, that save testicles, because, you know, they're 30 and they want a kid, but when they're 40 and they have a family by whatever way, shape, or form, they want the rest of their lives to be normal. And large procedures can hurt testicles. They don't fall off, but they will potentially not make normal amounts of testosterone, which can affect a man, a man for the next 60 years. And he has to think about that for 60 years. I have the planetary view in mind. Men need better care. This is a way to do it. It's also part of the Hippocratic Oath. Primum non nocere, first do no harm. Maybe first we should not consider doing retrieval procedures, but getting ejaculated sperm instead. Or maybe mapping, where you save testicles and you don't do large procedures. These are guiding principles. So for epididymal sperm, which is only found in obstructed men, versus testicular, there's no evidence of a difference in large series looking at pregnancy rates. For fresh versus frozen thawed epididymal sperm, there really is no difference. So those should guide the principles of your surgeon. For testicular sperm, when it's from men with obstruction or a blockage or no blockage, there are some differences. And it comes out when you look at fertilization rate, obstructed testicle sperm, 18% higher fertilization rates than non-obstructed testicles. So there is a performance difference in this sperm. 
from men who are zero, whether they're blocked or not. And when you look at the pregnancy rate, there's a 36% difference in pregnancy between men better when you're obstructed versus non-obstructed. So vasectomy patients who are obstructed tend to have higher pregnancy rates in their partners than men with non-obstructive vasospermia, typically because the sperm has probably carries more genetic issues with it from the latter. For obstructed versus non-obstructive vasospermia, insufficient evidence to recommend any single procedure over another. Basically what I'm telling you is there is no standard of care in terms of how you get the sperm. So when microdissection touts itself as being the best, that's not true. There is no standard of care. We're winging it here. And sperm retrieval in cases of non-obstructive vasospermia can be difficult because sperm production is patchy. And we first showed that in 2000 with mapping data. And sperm in these men can be in islands. It'll be there, but it'll be, but it'll be in islands. In cases of non-obstructive vasospermia, there's no relationship between the technique you use to get sperm and the outcomes with ICSI. Those are the facts. And in fact, I like delayed fresh sperm retrievals. I like doing sperm retrievals in tough cases the day before egg retrievals. And that way we allow the sperm in the dish to wake up. And there's good data from Dr. Old's group in Michigan that's published that the motility in testicular sperm will rise over a day or two at time. That does make finding sperm a lot easier if you have, if you have the, the motility to use as a guide. So I really like that. I think a lot of us in the, in the country do that now. And also, this is a complicated table, but I like fresh testicular sperm versus frozen testicular sperm in men with non-obstructive vasospermia. I didn't have gray hair before I started this, but the reason I do is because I'm available live to get this sperm. And why? Because of this paper we published with a student named Nate Bachtel 15, 16 years ago, showing that fresh testicle may not move, the sperm may not move, whether it's obstructed or not, but it's still quite valuable because it's alive. 90% of sperm in the testicle, when obtained fresh, is alive. Do you need motility? No. Is it nice? Yes. But this is optimizing sperm retrieval. Interestingly, when you look at the way sperm from different sources in the reproductive tract freeze and thaw, biologically they all act about the same. About half of them survive. What's catching people is the motility. So the motility in testicle really doesn't recover well. And so the same story for frozen thawed testicle is not true for fresh testicle. If you see a sperm after a thaw of frozen testicular sperm, about half of those are alive. So you're gonna, there's a good chance you might choose a dead sperm. So it becomes less optimal in my mind. And this is biology. I didn't make this up. How about fresh versus frozen testicular sperm? There is a difference in the implantation rate. So taking, this is the other reason I don't prefer frozen testicle if I can, and having it thawed if I can avoid it, is the implantation rate of embryos made from frozen thawed testicular sperm is lower than fresh testicular sperm. So those are the two reasons I like to do things live for a testicle. You have to think of non-obstructive vasospermia as a similar analogy would be apples on an apple tree. Not all branches have apples and some do and some don't. And if you climb up the wrong branch, you're stuck. And so we have developed two strategies in our field to take advantage of this problem or to, cap to capitalize on it. Um, and in general, we've done well. So here's a slide showing by diagnosis in non-obstructive vasospermia the chance of finding sperm. Cryptorchidism, 50 to 75% of men will have sperm. Varicocele, epididymitis, mumps, torsion, all above 50%. Post-chemotherapy, we published a couple papers, 55 to 75% of men, even men with bone marrow transplants who've received chemotherapy, uh, who have radiation therapy, can have sperm. We published it. It's amazing. And genetic infertility, we know a little bit more about that. In idiopathic cases, meaning no explanation, easily half will have sperm, up to 60%. And where are we with sperm detection in men with non-obstructive vasospermia? Well, this is a graph I made from a paper published recently in the Asian Journal of Andrology, where we looked at the number of times you sample a testicle, number of places, really, at the same time, and the rate of finding sperm. And in the beginning, we published a paper with Lip, Dr. Lipschultz and I and Ed Kim looking at a single biopsy, the ability of a single biopsy to find sperm. It's about 30%. So biopsies have utility. They're just not that great. If you add more sites, 3, 8, 14, 15, and these are published series, you find more in men with non-obstructive vasospermia. So mapping is currently at 
18 sites with a retection rate of around 60% in virgin cases. And that's, but what's interesting about this curve is it's flattening out. So is this the, is this the limit of the technology or is this the limit of the biology? We don't know, but I'm going to be figuring it out with something called metabolomics in a couple years, which would probably replace mapping and it's be non-invasive. But we need to look in 200 places, not in 24 places. So it's interesting what's happening to the field. So the current strategies for men with azospermia and no obstruction are two. You can do mapping, fine needle aspiration mapping, that was, I'm the guy who invented that. Or, and you can do microdissection, which was invented by Dr. Schlegel of New York. And they're very different. So here's how they're different. In mapping, you would do a procedure in the office in an hour, which would require healing of a day or two and a couple of pain pills and you would create a map of the testicle. You don't save sperm. It's just literally GPS. You're creating a map. If on evaluation of that, those samples which are taken percutaneously and non-invasively, two weeks later you'll get an answer. Sperm here, sperm here, sperm here. If there's sperm, then you would proceed to IVF and ICSI knowing that there was a good chance you'd find sperm at that time and therefore not have backup sperm or have other plans in place like egg freezing or cancel of the cycle. If you don't have sperm, that's a different story. No one has found it. So 60 cases that I know of, including 16 of my own, we've looked in other ways with microdissection and other things, and no one's found sperm when a map of mine has not shown sperm. And that's valuable information either way. If you have sperm, go. If you don't have sperm, maybe alternatives are better chosen now. Maybe you should close the door and open a window. And windows can be very good. If you do microdissection, it's basically a blind procedure performed real time. It's very invasive. It's three to four hours of surgery. It's bivalving the testicle under anesthesia, both of them usually, and trying to find pockets of sperm. So it's been very good. It's a very different, I would call inelegant and a little more medieval approach to the problem. But if you find sperm, you're doing IVF, you use it. If you don't, have a backup plan. Okay, so it's a very different approach. It's one step shorter because mapping doesn't save sperm. Mapping tells you you have it and then you tailor the procedure to the map to find sperm. So how are they different? So here is an example of what happens with mapping. This is to explain the differences. The map gets done. And this is a paper we published in two, about 10 years ago. You go to IVF and there's three kinds of maps. One is low sperm density everywhere. Another is a pocket of sperm at low density. Another is maybe one sperm in one site and one testicle. So needle in a haystack case. In the low sperm, global sperm production, low density, I stick a needle in the testicle. Sorry if you've just had lunch. A needle in the testicle under local anesthesia in 20 minutes and we get enough sperm 98% of the time. That was 10 years ago. I'll show you some new data. If there's a small amount of sperm in one site, we can direct the biopsy to that site. Forget the other testicle. Forget the other part of the testicle. Go right there also under local anesthesia, and try to find sperm. Success rate over 90%. Success to me means enough sperm for every egg. Not one, not two, enough sperm for every egg at IVF. 20, 30, 40, and usually sperm to freeze. So we don't do it again. Again, a guiding principle. The third case is when you have the needle in the haystack case. In that case, you will need a microdissection. I find those work the best and the chance of finding sperm 10 years ago was 81%. That means enough, you find one sperm on the map in the whole, both testicles, one sperm, and you go after it and you find enough sperm for all eggs 81% of the time. That's optimizing care. But you also have to realize these sperm retrieval procedures aren't the same. Sticking a needle in a testicle, honestly, is the safest thing you can do. Taking a biopsy is a little more aggressive. Doing a microdissection is the most aggressive associated with a 15 to 50% chance of hypogonadism. That means the man's testosterone will, will not come back to baseline after a year, regardless of where he started. That's how destructive the process, procedure is. And that's not to be you know, taken lightly for a man's, for man's life. Here's our approach at the Turret Clinic, non-obstructive azospermic. We, we don't have a lot of time. We do a microdissection because with mapping, you have to wait a couple months to get things sorted out. If they do have one to three months of time and they're not in too much of a super rush, you could do a mapping procedure, guide your sperm retrieval and hone it down. If you have three to six months, yes, let's take some time, 
maybe fix varicose seals, maybe put on medications if appropriate, try to get ejaculate sperm going that we can freeze, and then go forward. This is an optimized regimen for sperm retrieval. So what's the big difference, really, between microdissection and mapping? Let me show you in a series of 100 or so patients over the last year at the Turk Clinic what we've done. So some, I give everyone the option, based on that algorithm, of either going forward with microdissection or having a map. I don't tell them what to do. I give them the data, and they decide. And I do what's best for them. So it just so happened that about a third of the men last year chose to do a microdissection without a map. And the other two-thirds chose mapping. And then after mapping, they went forward, and after microdissection, or with microdissection, they went forward with IVF. And here's the results. In unmapped men who went for just a microdissection with no prior procedure, like a map, 53% of the time I found enough sperm for all eggs. That compares to the best of them. Okay, so that's my basic microdissection data. If you take the same or different set of patients, they weren't randomized, and you put and you alpha the mapping and they do it and they have sperm on their map and they go to sperm retrieval, about half the men will sort out to need a microdissection, but the other half won't. So there's your first savings. Half the men won't need a microdissection after mapping. And in the men who went for lesser procedures that were guided by the map, 100% of the time we found enough sperm for all eggs, 100%. If they did need a microdissection because they were a very difficult map, 92% of the time we found enough sperm for all eggs. 53 versus 92. That's the difference. That's optimization. Here's another difference between microdissection and mapping. In these same men, we have to ask, how many times did you operate on both testicles? Because if you operate on one, you don't really worry about long-term complications and low testosterone and chronic pain as much as you would if you operate on two. And if you're doing a blind procedure like microdissection, you're going to be doing two a lot because you don't know where to start. If, you're doing, if you have a map like GPS, you know where to start. So here we go. Same patients. Of the third of the patients last year who got microdissections performed blindly, 84% got both testicles operated on to get enough sperm for all eggs. That's 8 out of 10. If you did a mapping ahead of time, again, the split was about half needing a microdissection, half not. 19% of microdissected men needed two testicles operated on. 19%. That's six-fold less than a blind microdissection. And only 15 to 14 percent of men with lower, needing lower procedures needed a, a bilateral procedure. So that's called saving testicles, and I think that is a way to optimize sperm retrieval. Let's go to the laboratory as a final, a final statement. Doing these procedures demands expertise, but the lab expertise is probably more important. After we've done a couple microdissections, 25, 50, you sort of know what you're doing as a surgeon. I mean, it's, it's playing the same song all the time. Mapping's similar. But what really helps you get the sperm for the patient is a lab that's ready to go and not surprised by a difficult case coming up today. Right? Put down your coffee and get to work. No, that's not the way we do this. At the Turek Clinic, I have a table in the lab on a piece of paper. And if you see my name there and it says TASA with an A or MESA with an A or TASA with an E, or microdissection, it says below it how many man hours I need for that case while I'm doing it. So how many technicians? And you can do what you want. You can, I can have the lab do two technicians for an hour, three technicians for two hours, but I'm going to need six man hours for microdissection while I'm doing the procedure. I'm not just going to do it, stop, send the sperm somewhere and have them look. I'm going to do it with them and have them judge me and give me real-time feedback. And that gives you great results. And you may say, these results seem incredible. That's why. I think it's why. I mean, it, I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do, but these guys have to be very good. So your lab matters when it comes to dissection and doing these difficult procedures. You're trying to optimize it for the patient. Laboratory effort is also important in terms of freezing sperm, and this is where we're hurting a little with technology. Freezing low numbers of sperm is very important. I know these sperm work well. If we can get moving sperm on the back end, it'd be great and save procedures. And I've done a lot of repeat procedures, and mapping's very good at telling us how to do that, but we need to work on cryo loops and using zo empty zonas and things like that, innovative ways to find sperm. We don't have a lot of these right now, but I encourage young people in the field to look into it, and I've got some ideas of my own. So in summary, for optimizing sperm retrieval in men with non-obstructive azospermia, patients really only want one procedure. They really do. You make more friends that way. 
Number two, they like their testosterones where they are. They don't like them lower, and they will be thinking about it a year after their, their family's built. You know, oh my God, I've got to take this stuff for the rest of my life. You have one good shot at a patient. That's my theory. Take your best shot at them. So plan and optimize. And so optimizing therapy, surgical, medical, patient issues, sperm retrievals, and laboratory procedures are very important for all these men. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today.